you know, we're as important in the biosphere as microbes. Life does disturb equilibrium. So if you're looking for order, you know, take yourself to a dead planet and die, and you can be, you can be part of the background static there. Have courage and remember, humans are the most unstable element of the ecosystem. You're you're a biospherian. Uh, newsflash, so are you. Well, no, I don't know. Us? I guess if you're an alien and you come down to Earth, yeah, during the time that you're here on Earth, you know, you are a biospherian. It, that is unless you don't breathe air hmm. or eat anything or excrete anything or outgas anything. Uh, so... You, you guys could be plastic, uh, robotic androids. But if you, like, do, you know, Earth metabolism, you're a biospherian. But, yeah, I mean, you're referring to my great, uh, my great luck in spending two years inside a, a small biosphere. How do you define a biosphere? Well, how do you Good define question. a biosphere? Well. Unfortunately, the textbooks still say... A biosphere is the thin layer of, of life on planet Earth. Fair and enough. And that is such a crappy definition <laughs> that it should be, you know, like uh, whited out in every textbook. The biosphere is a close to 4 billion year old superorganism that has changed the face of the Earth has invented many incredible uh, biodiversity innovations. Uh, so what we think of as the Earth is really a product, kind of an interplay between planetary forces, the cosmic environment, and the incredible power of life. And it goes pretty deep into the crust from what I understand, right? Well, you know, if you think about, you know, how deep, the, <laughs> how big the planet is, I understand the thin, you know, I think they've, they've found microbes, you know, kilometers down and as far up in the atmosphere, it gets a little bit thinner, but you find microbes and, you know, life forms pretty much right through the atmosphere, but it's certainly concentrated much more in the near, er, you know, near planetary surface and soils which are a living being, you know, I mean, life is concentrated in those arenas, but not to be underestimated. The, well, the other point that, that I don't like about the way people think about the biosphere is, and this is how I was taught, you know, when I went through uh, what's laughably called our education system in the 50s and 60s, they kind of say, well, isn't it lucky that life happens to be on this really nice and fairly habitable planet called Earth. So we're like passive passengers on, we hope it's not the Titanic, <laughs> you know, on the ship. Mm. But in fact, life has been making the planet, you know, more amenable to life. And the last one, and I really think that there's a new generation to where this is beginning to be understood the biosphere is the life support system for all humans and for every other living creature on planet Earth. So it's a life support system that's built out of the pieces that are contained within it. Yeah. I mean, and of course, you know, there, there's the impact of geology and mineral formations and, and the, the, you know, the solar condition. Uh, but yeah. I mean, life has transformed uh, the planet. And, you know, people know much more about um, Gaia. Mm -hmm. Jim Lovelock and Lynn Margulis came mm -hmm. up with this theory that, you know, there's like, you know, the biosphere, which they liken, they, they use the Greek goddess to the earth. And they said, you know, Gaia is actively working to make life more abundant and make, make uh, the earth more possible to support more life. Do you disagree life with that? Life. Yeah. 
Do, life begets life, yeah. Is the biosphere separate and distinct from the Gaia hypothesis, or is this two names for the same sort of idea? Uh, you know, Gaia, there are whole books written on Gaia and exactly how you define Gaia. Mm. Uh, I, I tend to not, although uh, both Jim Lovelock and Lynn Margulis are good friends and inspirations to myself and my colleagues and, you know, informed a lot of our work. But we prefer to go back to the Vernatsky tradition, the great uh, Ukrainian-Russian uh, scientist who really laid the basis of our modern understanding of the biosphere, which I was kind of explaining. I mean, Vernatsky, who started life as a biochemist, uh, finally became, no, he started life as a geochemist, and he invented the science of biogeochemistry. Mm, because, which is the idea that creatures that are alive are metabolizing inorganic substances like rocks and minerals, thereby yeah. bringing them into life. How does really? this tie in with, uh, who is it, Thomas Gold? Is yeah, the name? Deep Hot Biosphere guy. Deep Hot Biosphere. He, that's a good question. I don't know that he was really into biogeochemical cycles. Was he friends with these Russians? Uh, I don't know. Do you know Thomas Gold? No, I, I profess a lot of ignorance about it. Although I think, you know, if he's pointing to that there are depths of the biosphere that we don't understand, I think he's controversial also because he says... Don't worry about fossil fuels. I think this is forgetting about climate change mm. because it's being made as rapidly as possible. But mm -hmm. anyway, let, let's let's stick to the main line here. Who <laughs> is revolutionary enough? Anyway, he he invented biogeochemistry because a lot of the we didn't invent it. He described it, right? Yeah, the well, bacteria. Yeah. Let's let's give bacteria their due. The bacteria invented biogeochemistry. Well, this is true. This is true. And, and uh, you know, <laughs> with your, your alien understanding of bacteria, both of you, you, you guys probably know more than I do. But, but they were like these really large uh, phenomena, like these enormous iron deposits all over the world, the banded iron deposits, mm -hmm. that before Vernatsky and people like him were, were taken to be just geological depositions. And lo and behold, as you're pointing out, these were actually deposited by microbes who ran the biosphere very well, thank you very much, for three and a half billion years. And all of the higher, so-called higher, complex multicellular organisms, you know, we've only been around for 500 million years or so. So how did you, Mark Nelson, come to be locked in a giant version of or a small version of this giant biosphere for a year two years two years two years, two years. yeah can we just explain yeah. the project really briefly can you summarize yeah. it for people who aren't totally aware yeah, or haven't seen the movie or read the books sure let's start with that because my, my history is is way more convoluted and perhaps <laughs> idiosyncratic anyway so biosphere 2 project we launched it at the end of 1984 and the basic idea was that we wanted to make a sealed, materially closed, so that matter didn't go in and out, mini version of a biospheric system, so that we could study how biospheres operate. So to, and it certainly wasn't a model of planet Earth. You know, you couldn't do that in the three acres or so. Or, if we have metric people, 1.2 hectare footprint. <laughs> and we, you know, we wanted to have the elements that uh, are the major vectors in our global biosphere. So I hope this- And you did this in the desert somewhere? We did it in the desert in Southern Arizona. Cool. And it included seven different biomes. Biome, you know, even if you don't know the word, you know the concept. A biome is a rainforest, a desert, a mangrove wetland. A habitat. Country. Yeah, that's not quite right, but anyway. Biome. Well, it's like a collection of conditions, right? 
Yeah, you know, that there's a particular type of so the soils, their climates, there are different kinds of uh, microbes and animals, you know. You don't get uh, you know, Bengal tigers in the ocean or really in hardcore deserts, etc. So so there was one part of Biosphere 2 that included miniature analog biomes from rainforest to fog desert, coastal desert, and on the, the wetter side from a Everglades wetland from freshwater marsh to red mangroves and a mini ocean that was only like 1 million gallons. It was about 20 feet deep and 65 feet long, but we had the largest, still the largest man-made, person-made, human-designed coral reef, mm. living coral reef collected in the Caribbean. Then there were two anthropogenic biomes. You know, if we were classical 19th century ecologists, we would have called it a day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so humans and technology are part of the biosphere. That's so we have yeah, and if you're going to have people in there, you need to raise, you know, grow food for them. So we had what we call the intensive agricultural biome, a farm, mm -hmm. where we had to recycle all of our nutrients and not pollute the system, so no toxic chemicals. And then we, what we like to call a mini city, the human habitat, where we had our personal rooms and kitchens and workshops and laboratories. So Biosphere 2 was all under one roof. Of course, it was very spectacular architecturally because we wanted to make the first human constructed biosphere be inspirational. And our architects decided, yeah, let's pay homage to world architecture. So, and I encourage people to go and look at images of Biosphere 2 online. Yeah, it's amazing. It's quite a production. Who paid for this, by the way? Who 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 built this thing? It was it was privately funded. One of our colleagues, he was then a director of our institute. So here, by the way, you can see mm. we have everything from Babylonian arches that's covering the, the farm mm. to step pyramids and geodesic domes over these lungs, these variable volume structures. So it's pretty stunning. And, you know, for a human construction, you know, three acres and ceilings that were pushing 90 foot tall, it, you know, is a pretty impressive. In fact, it took us about five years after a lot of R&D to build this thing. And so the people who wanted to fund this, were they interested in the experiment itself for scientific reasons, or were they hoping to sort of apply it technologically to space travel, or? Both, both and. I mean, Biosphere 2 is pretty complex. So on the one hand, if we're ever to really live in space, not just take picnic lunches on space shuttles or whatever, we're going to need to figure out how to make systems that regenerate the air, water, and produce good food mm -hmm. because resupply from Earth is crazy. Yeah. Right. So Biosphere 2 on the space side was, you know, one of the most audacious, daring, kick-ass experiments. <laughs> and let's find out what we know and we don't know about how to do this. And then on the Earth side, we know surprisingly little when you get down to it, about what makes our biosphere successful. We know it's persisted for four, you know, close to 4 billion years, but it's gone through amazing transformations. You know, when photosynthesis got invented by living organisms, the cyanobacteria, uh, they released oxygen, which was a deadly poison. Right. And then there was a huge extinction sort of event in terms of bacterial lineages because most of them couldn't live in the presence of high quantities of oxygen, right? So the story of the Earth is this kind of boom and bust thing where someone figures out, <laughs> well, isn't it, right? Somebody figures out something that works really well for them or they start to produce this waste product that is absolutely toxic to everybody around them. And they kill huge swaths of the population, and then there's new life forms that arise. Is that what's happening in the ocean right now? I mean, I don't know. 
don't know. But but it's isn't it ironic? I mean, Earth history is a fascinating. It's way better than a Hollywood movie. Yeah, well, it's longer, Hollywood longer. Mo- I don't know Hollywood if people have that kind of movies, attention. Well, this is true. See, a Hollywood movie, they they pretty much try to keep it under two two hours. This would be, how talking. many how many hours is four billion years of evolution? <laughs> The we need to have a good. We need to make a good trailer, though. <laughs> yeah, exactly. A lot of explosions. In thirty-five seconds with a few exciting sound bites. But it's so ironic that oxygen, without which, you know, we're we're history. You know, if you can't take your next breath and it isn't twenty or twenty-one percent oxygen, goodbye, Charlie. Mm. Uh, kind of thing. It's so amazing to me that that was the first really deadly toxin produced by life. And then oxygen has this amazing uh, property that it spontaneously naturally produces ozone. Mm. And, you know, it's not spoken about now, but we still have kind of an issue about the depletion of the ozone layer. So because the, you know, the life was pretty much only deep underground on the land or in the ocean, that once that ozone layer formed, then that protected the the land surfaces, the continents of Earth from this deadly radiation. So life could emerge onto the land. It's so such it's, a great story, isn't it? Where everything leads into the next phase, which is why the story of humans is so complex, right? Because there's this desire to take humans out of nature. Humans are different than nature. Humans are separate from it. And yet, the story of the Earth is full of creatures that do something similar to the humans. They, they produce, remodel their environments. Yeah, they remodel their environments, and everybody has to remodel around them. <laughs> Making it sound like remodeling an apartment. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've remodeled we'll this tech that. a few times. Now, now, let me just say, you know, in the context uh, for people who are not old enough to remember those days, in the 1980s and early 90s, so, so we, we started the project in 84, did a lot of R&D, brought in world-class ecologists and engineers, got them to talk the same language, and there's a whole great drama story about that, uh, and, and built the facility. Then we inserted the eight people, you know, uh, and basically we were the aboriginals, the the primal inhabitants of Biosphere 2. And, you know, so then there was a debate, should we call ourselves Bionauts, Echonauts? (laughs) But, you know, then someone came up with the inspired suggestion, call, call the crews inside there Biospherians because their task is to keep this biosphere healthy, to keep the technology that you need when you build an artificial world uh, going. They need to regulate their activities and they need to learn what does it mean to be a biospherian. And at the time that we were doing Biosphere 2, the company, the joint venture that we formed with our investor, Ed Bass primarily, we called it Space Biospheres Ventures. Mm. And when I was on the phone to people, almost everybody asked me how to spell the word biosphere. Hmm. It's kind of inconceivable now, right? <laughs> Sustainability was maybe a decade in the future, you know. <laughs> so the you know, and and people told us at the time, you guys are fifty years ahead of your time. And if you read about the the project, it it touched a nerve around the planet, big time. And we didn't expect that. We we bought we built the project in southern Arizona, which you know is really hot and remote. And yeah, not the center of the globe. <laughs> people go there from Thanksgiving until maybe Easter, and then it you know it hits a hundred degrees Fahrenheit for months on end continuously. We expected to do a quiet R and D project, and because it was privately financed although with a lot of social and, you know, uh, research benefits that we wanted to reap, we expected to recoup the investment by selling one to Euro Disney, to Tokyo, to <laughs> London, to places where millions and millions of people go. Uh, 
But you know, once once images, even of the plans, the designs of Biosphere Two hit the media first in Europe and then the U.S. and then around the world, it just captured the people's imaginations, because it's really hard to visualize and you know think about the Earth's biosphere because it's so big on a human scale. Yeah, compress it into three acres, which is like one and a half American or two American football fields. Well, if and I remember then, correctly, you were you were artists, and it, it, the the sort of the spirit of the biosphere wasn't driven purely in the name of academic science. There was this desire to produce something that was beautiful and functional and inspiring. A piece of performance art, right? I confess, actually, that <laughs> th this is actually, you, you were asking how, how, you know, what series of, of misfortunes and bad luck got me into bias for two, for two years. When I finished, you know, and I'm a good, you know, uh, upwardly mobile, first generation Jewish immigrant kid from, from Flushing, Queens. Yeah, you were not Atlanta. supposed to end up inside of a greenhouse in a desert. No, you're supposed to, you know, like have a little, you know, you're supposed to have enough titles and, you know. Maybe a lawyer, figure. maybe a nice practice. Five, yeah. Looking yeah, at like warts on people, burning if them you off. Were born, if you were born male in my family, you're expected to become a doctor. And that doesn't mean a PhD. That means a medical doctor. And, you know, so that was the, the fate hanging over me. <laughs> and it, But, you know, but in truth, I just hated the idea of, pick, you know, pick something off of this Chinese menu that we call life and make that your career and make that define you. So I wanted something more. And so when I graduated from, from Dartmouth in 1968, uh, and I ran into this group of people who had been doing theater in New York, but, you know, were thinking ecologically, and they had just bought 160 acres of the crappiest land in New Mexico you could ever imagine. <laughs> and I had never seen, you know, the, the desert Southwest. Mm. When I first came here, they said, you know, we do three things concurrently. We do eco ecological work, and it's going to be rest restoring this land and trying to make an oasis in the desert. We're going to do theater as our artistic expression. And theater is re also really good if you're living in small communities because it's psychodrama at a certain <laughs> level. What's psychodrama? Group group therapy. Mm. And we're and we're going to emphasize enterprise, so that you know he who pays the fiddler you know calls the tune, so that we can you know, we can make mistakes, we can have failures, and we can bootstrap ourselves into things. So we started with New Mexico. And then what do you do after New Mexico, after, you know, a, a lot of tree planting and soil building? Well, if you can build a ship and sail the world's oceans, then maybe you'll have a little bit of an inkling of what, you know, life on planet Earth is. So. That's, that's a jump. You say that as if it's the <laughs> obvious next step, but that's, that's a jump right there. So you, you well, as you the know, group, what was the name of the group? Was that Biosphere 1? Mm. No, Biosphere oh, by, yeah. was the Earth, right? Oh, I gotcha. What was I know, you know, and, and when we started uh, Biosphere 2, I, I just loved it. People would say, where's Biosphere 1? Was that an, another <laughs> experiment that flopped, you know, maybe in Nevada or something? No, Biosphere 1 is the Earth. You're standing now, on it, buddy. It, we named it Biosphere 2 because to emphasize to people how precious, how incredibly important biospheres are. You know, and I when I look at how people and institutions and and modern cultures disrespect life and think there's no bounds for if, if humans want to do it and we have the technology and it makes money, you know, go for it. Is it's like astronauts on a spacecraft. It's like them trying to sabotage their life support system, or let's just push our life support system and see if it's going to totally fail or not. That's kind of the present moment on planet Earth. And we realized that back in the late 60s and early 70s. So our ecological work, we call the Institute of Ecotechnics. 
and you know, with the idea that we could balance the eco and the techno. How'd that work out? It's working out. It it led to the great adventure. That that's partly why <laughs> it was logical for us. You know, where do you go from a desert project? Well, the ocean, which does cover two thirds of planet Earth. And you built a boat. A ship. A ship, yeah, like a, a sailing ship. And none of you knew, did anyone know how to sail? We actually uh, worked with a marine architect, and a number of us, including myself, went up to northern Scotland. And we got on a, uh, I, I think it was sort of an outward bound English schooner training ship. Hmm. Uh, and well, we studied well. books on sailing. A couple of us, you know, had grown up in New England and, you know, were a little bit better than complete landlubbers. But, you know, the, I was going to say, you know, the theater was called the theater of all possibilities. Mm. And we kind of had this mantra, you know, if people have done this, then we can do it. Yeah. I love that. I think, I, you know, you look through human history and people have not, you know, gotten certified by a bureaucracy, government or university. They, you know, humans are pretty intelligent. And especially in the ship, you know, you don't want to wind up, you know, once you're on a, on a ship, then the idea that death is a moment and a mistake away <laughs> becomes a lot clearer. How long did you spend on the ship? Myself, only about three months. I, I, would, I joined it in the Caribbean and we sailed up to Miami and then I, I was on the first part of the first Atlantic crossing. And totally loved it, I have to say. I loved, you know, that they call the the uh, beginning seamen are called able-bodied seamen. Mm. And, and for many years, we had a uh, we had courses at all of our ecotechnic projects. But you know, that was kind of uh, learning to be a seaman one hundred and one. Did you have any close, or, you know, close encounters with with uh, the sea? Any anything scary happen? Uh, if you'd call winding up in a fairly low level hurricane, uh, when we, when we, uh, when we were between, uh, Miami and Bermuda and I got on deck and I was looking at waves that were twice the height of the ship I was sailing on. Oh no. Uh, yeah, I, I thought. Just one bad wave, and maybe we're all dead. Wow! And you know, so so what you do in those circumstances, you shorten sail, and you know, we were cooking on a at that point a wood burning stove. Wow! In Whoa. the kitchen, and all the cakes came up at a, a severe angle because the, the ship was basically you know uh, sideways to the wind, and I, I was kind of a choleric. I was kind of an angry young man. <laughs> and I, I remember the great joy, you know, and, and after three days, you begin to calm down. Maybe we're not going to die. <laughs> yeah, the bad place yeah, for ships is actually yeah. near coast because then they get rammed into, you know, into piers and, you know, mm -hmm. washed up on board. Anyway, I, I went out there and I started screaming and throwing a, you know, a good old fashioned temper champer. <laughs> I couldn't hear myself scream. The, the sound of the wind and the roar of, of the sea was such. And it kind of, you know, I think this is a wonderful thing about, you know, encountering the biosphere and its many manifestations. Sometimes it's so gentle and Byron-like and, you know, we're all romantic poets. And sometimes it is so refreshing to actually discover, because humans, we have a very distorted idea of our power. Mm. And you get yourself on a ship in a fairly, you know, big blow, you know, uh, w then you realize, you know, we are small. Things and come it, into perspective. <laughs> yeah. Same thing, you know, so from, from uh, so I, my obligations at the ranch, I was put in charge of uh, trees and farming. Hmm. So, you know, from knowing nothing, I, you know, started to learn how to be a farmer and how to plant trees. And I planted the orchard that we still tend and produces in a good year, 30,000 pounds of fruit. Oh, wow. uh, this is in New Mexico? 
This is in New Mexico. Are yeah, you there right home. now? I am. I'm at, I'm at Synergia Ranch. Oh, cool. Mm, very cool. So in 1978, you know, so so the idea was, and and when you look back at Biosphere Two, what would be a perfect training to have a cadre of people ready to do a project like this? So we decided, okay, now we have a ship that's starting to sail the world's oceans, but there are all of these other biomes. Mm. So in a period of about six years, we started a project one in the world city. London, that's called the October Gallery. Hmm. One in the Mediterranean uh, biome uh, in Aix-en-Provence, France. One in the tropical savanna, and that's the one that I, I uh, went and helped start our, we had two projects there originally, way up in the outback of Australia, sort of halfway between or two thirds of the way between Perth and Darwin. And then our last kind of major project is and which is still ongoing in Puerto Rico in the rainforest to try to develop sustainable forestry hmm. practices. So we, you know, we thought in terms of biomes. So when we, you know, we're thinking about how do you put together something that could be a, a semblance to a working biosphere, you know, we had that background and my institute, my very small, you know, completely underfunded <laughs> institute, you know, for our education and for what's now called networking, we would pull together these international conferences and basically invite our heroes. And our heroes were scientists, they were explorers, they were thinkers, they were artists. And, you know, to us, it's second nature. I mean, I think it's still the, the great unknown is getting scientists and artists together. It's like, why wouldn't you do that? And so we had a series of biomic conferences culminating in the Planet Earth Conference in 1980. And there's a lot of footage of that in Spaceship Earth. So we were meeting, you know, these really great uh, people, engineers, scientists, whatever, from around the world. And we offered them economy flights and we cooked their food and you know, <laughs> We, we, we reduced our overhead, but we made it small meetings where people could actually jump out of their little academic cages if they were scientists to meet other interesting people. So when That's we awesome. started Biosphere 2, we had like this network from, you know, 10, 12 years of having these international meetings. So we had, you know, we, we knew some of the best rainforest ecologists and, and you know, people like that people in this in space industry, etc. And that's such a reflection of the success that you had. Really did your homework. Yeah, you had a group of people who believed in a shared vision of the planet. And then there was this push to make a project that centered it. And you had all this expertise to be able to bring together which without that, if you had just started from scratch, not knowing any of these people, it, it's hard to imagine the project surviving and flourishing the way that it did. Yeah, totally. Although, you know, I have to say, you know, we look back and, oh, yeah, we built Bias for two. We had one crew stay in there for two years with some problems. We can get to that. Some surprises. And, you know, there were, there were real difficult times, you know, to do that. And a second crew, you know, that they were supposed to be in there for a year, but then the takeover happened, you know, but really the and, amount And the of, takeover was by Steve Bannon? Well, he was brought in uh, as a takeover uh, consultant. That was maybe but the yeah. weirdest part of that movie. <laughs> Definitely the weirdest yeah. part. But well, we're getting ahead of ourselves. Yeah, we so are, we are. How Sorry. did you guys Sorry. decide to lock yourselves in a tank for two years? Yep. Oh, are we getting back to that question? Well, we have to. We have to be linear about this. Okay. I thought we nailed that. Oh, yeah. So so we're talking <laughs> about space, space application. You know, we understood because, you know, from our own work in these different biomes, and we only took on projects that were difficult. You know, if if it's really easy, it's economically viable, and why do it? Hmm. Other people would do it. So, yeah. Uh, we bought this ranch for what's relatively a song because it's considered completely worthless. You can't graze animals. The topsoil is long gone. 
There were the ruins of buildings literally burnt down for the fire insurance. We went up into the <laughs> tropical savanna, and the government gave us the land, sold us the land at $1.60 an acre. Wow. It was probably a little bit more, more expensive than it was worth. But they had millions and millions of acres, and they said, well, if these crazed you know, ecologists can come here and they think they can actually restore this thing, more power to them because we have millions of similar acres. We go into the Puerto Rican you know, secondary rainforest, and secondary rainforest is considered completely worthless. You know, pe- you know the indigenous and other people you know, abandon it because it takes so long to grow trees that are worth anything. Secondary rainforest is after the original rainforest has yeah. been logged and is regrowing. Yeah, exa- exactly. And, and Puerto Rico, you know, was colonized first by the Spanish and then by the, the Americanskis, uh, by the Americans. And yeah, so they cut out the best trees. The land that we're, we bought, again, really, really cheaply, you know, was cut down for both timber and then a coffee plantation. And even that was abandoned. So secondary rainforest is what grows up in its stead. Mm. And our thought was, if we can demonstrate that we can produce timber on second in secondary rainforest, that should take the pressure off of cutting down primary rainforest. Mm you know, which have all those other, you know, restoring the oxygen and supporting amazing biodiversity and indigenous peoples of the Amazon and every other rainforest. Yes, but, you know, so we crazy synergists, we call ourselves, because we're very influenced by Bucky Fuller. And, you know, so our thing is that, well, maybe the universe is running downhill, entropy, but life is a synergetic property. Life actually creates order, makes diversity, you know, spreads out into every conceivable region. So our our lodestone, and that's why we call this ranch in New Mexico, Synergia Ranch, Synergy Ranch, a synergetic system kind of pushes the ball uphill. And, you know, a great definition is it's something where the whole, where the total system is much more and unpredictable than studying the parts. Hmm. Well, so, this is this idea of emergence, yeah, where you have something that's made out of simple, predictable parts, and together they behave in a way that you couldn't have imagined. Right. Yeah, and life is replete with it. And I think, you know, so Bucky Fuller was a big guy. Let's do more with less. Mm. You know, that that inspired his whole, the geodesic domes, tensegrity. And it, it's kind of like uh, life is very economical. And, it, you know, that's why there are, you know, even in the driest desert, you know, Atacama, Atacama Desert in South America, you find microbes. You find microbes in the dry valleys of Antarctica. Life is amazingly inventive, adaptable, and it will work with whatever the conditions are. Quite astounding. Well, it's also amazing because life has the ability to actually externalize more entropy in the process. Like life can destroy things better than anything else, really, too, as far as the reaction goes. In terms of just taking it apart to component pieces? Yeah. Well, that's that biogeochemical cycle again, right? It really busts the world up pretty well, too, in creating all that order. Are you talking about when you take a carrot and you boil it or you take a chicken and you fry it? I'm thinking I'm talking (laughs) about just respiration in general. And there's this guy, I forget what his name is, I'm blanking on it right now, but he's human and he defined life actually as something along the lines of the ability to produce maximum entropy because living systems actually produce more entropy than anything, any other natural process, which is interesting, external to themselves. They themselves are very ordered, but produce a lot of entropy around them, right? right Life kind right. of breaks apart things that are ordered and then allows them to be disordered in the aftermath. Yeah, check it uh, out. Like when you I eat really, something, like okay. when you eat something, like you said, like you fry a chicken, you take a chicken, and that's a really entropically ordered thing, right? The chicken is no less ordered than any other life form. And then you eat it and it turns into poop. Exactly. That's pretty entropic, right? 
Well, sure. no, but then, but then, like, first off, you recycle the nutrients, Maybe. and your your shit and the byproducts are recycled by life. I'm not a thermodynamicist, but you know, I find it interesting. We were talking about Gaia before. Jim Lovelock, you know, talks about his his uh, his epiphany, his his revelation. He was called in as a consultant. He's an atmospheric chemist hmm. to look at the possibility of there being life on Mars when they were planning the Viking missions in the early 70s. And he came up with this insight that if a planet is basically thermodynamically predictable, it's at stasis. You know, it's at equilibrium. Hmm. Life does disturb equilibrium. Life is really far from equilibrium. Like as soon as something dies, then it goes back to equilibrium. Yeah. Exactly. So if you're looking for order, you know, take yourself to a dead planet and die. And you, can be, <laughs> you can be part of the background static there. Yeah. So, I, you know, I, I don't want to, you know, debate thermodynamics because I, I, it's not my forte. But, you know, it, that may be true. But the, the, the other property of life is it tends to incorporate every waste product, every byproduct into it, into its circulation. And so, you know, one of the, the wonders of being in Biosphere 2 was there was no trash, there was no garbage. Wow. And, you know, we put an obligation on all the technologies that went in there that all their byproducts couldn't poison and be unrecyclable by the life systems inside of it. What was the hardest so, I mean, piece of technology to get functional under those constraints? I think it was the oxygen system, from what I recall. Well, the oxygen system, well, I remember there being a problem. But like in terms of machines, in terms of waste products, what was most difficult to prevent from poisoning you? Well, I mean, there was a lot of the, you know, the, the, uh, the drama between the ecologists and the engineers, first off, was that engineers have a completely different mindset yeah. than ecologists. Mm -hmm. And they speak a different language. Yep. Totally. And, They're rarely the same you know, person. I'm cut. What? They're rarely Even the same the person. <laughs> I know. We're one big human, you know, mega brain. I, I agree with that. <laughs> and, and, you know, so I have a little bit of an engineer, maybe a little bit larger of an ecologist. You know, and generally the ecologists are like horrified. Here comes the engineers. Here comes technology, bulldozers, and got you know, our our you know our thing is going to be destroyed by them. And the engineers are like, well, you know, if you want if you want a stream in your rainforest or in your savanna, you want a waterfall, and you want this water to recirculate, you're going to have to learn enough engineering to tell us. So we can figure out what kind of pumps and recirculation things are needed. Mm. There's no, there's no wind in Biosphere Two. How are we going to create a climate system? So to me, you know, Biosphere Two is an amazing success even before we put people in it, in that we demonstrated that engineers and ecologists could work together. And when the engineers, you know, they were very frustrated. Because an engineer likes to say, well, I'm going to build a bridge or put up a building or do this or that, and no one's going to die. Right? <laughs> it's going to be economical, and it's going to – and when they realize that we're not only asking you to do what nobody had ever done, seal to where there's less than 1% of the air exchanges per month, yeah. and redo all this other stuff, create a climate system, you know, move water around, you know, cool and heat the thing, you know produce tides in, in the ocean, but we can't do anything that doesn't support life. So when I think about the legacy of Biosphere 2, and, you know, I mean, if it was just a, you know, a brief experiment in the Arizona desert in the 90s, eh, you know, it should be on some quiz show. But what I, why I like talking about Biosphere 2 is the implications of what we did, the legacy and the relevance, because we're in quite a pickle, uh, which I think you guys are on top of, we're in really a pickle. I mean, I've, I was talking to a friend who said, you know, it's like we know there's a cliff, you know, a mile, a mile over there, and we're in a car, and we're going 80 miles an hour, 
and we don't really know what options we have other than maybe back off on the gas so we get to 40 miles an hour over that cliff. We're in a big pickle. And one of the really profound things about Biosphere 2 is that how well we redesigned the technosphere to be in the support of life. Mm -hmm. It was stunning, stunning. So, and this doesn't even crack open the human issues, right? Like you had engineers and ecologists, but were there psychologists or some other spiritual advisors to sort of... (laughs) Sorry? I said that's a great question. Well, yeah, it just seems like, what I mean, I'm really curious, what was it like hanging out with only seven other people for two years? Oh, it was paradise. (laughs) It was hell. It was everything in between. Two of you guys got married, right? Two, yeah, two. That they were couples that went into bias for two. I see. I see. So we had decided early on that you know eight people was a really good uh, number. Did anybody get divorced? Had, uh, no, no. That's good. And I, I, I did wind up again. Darkness was a good preparation. <laughs> I wound up, uh, you know, celibate for two years. Maybe that's why I started writing a lot and. <laughs> Add energy that I usually put into relationships. But, you know, when we had, so we built a Bias for Two test module, mm. you know, mm. really small thing. We packed it full of, you know, life forms, plants from all of the biomes, a little constructed wetland for the sewage, mm. a tiny little room, you know, with a little stove and a, a fold out Murphy's bed, you know, uh, and we had human closures in there. And when the first person who was the the visionary really behind Echo Technics and Bias for Two, John Allen, when he was about to go in there for three days, we got a telex. Kids, you remember telexes? No. Anyway, they were before faxes and they were before the internet. After semaphore, before faxes. Yeah. They were, you know, they were after the, the um, invention of fire. Mm, and mm. Stone Age and before the internet. Mm. Anyway, we got a telex from a, a good pal of ours in, in Moscow, Yevgeny Shepolev. He was at the Institute of Biomedical Problems. And he has the honor of being the first human to spend 24 hours in a closed system. Hmm. His only companion was a vat of algae. They're and very so good he, companions, you know. They shouldn't knock the algae. Uh, yeah, but they didn't do a complete job because I, I used to meet him at space conferences and he was a chain smoker. Oh, no. And, uh, Johnny Appleseed by any means. And I remember we, we were taking a break and he was saying in his broken English, you know, when I went back, you know, he came out to the applause of his colleagues. Yeah, you stayed in there. He went back in and he felt like throwing up. Because the algae was regenerating the air and the water, but there are all these trace gases that they couldn't handle. Anyway, so he sends a telex and he says, have courage and remember, humans are the most unstable element of the ecosystem. Uh, and ominous. <laughs> ominous. Hey. You know, after Bias for Two, and we had great uh, personal difficulties, group difficulties, and I'm happy to talk about them. But then I went back to academia to get a (laughs) master's and PhD, and I looked at the infighting, not just among the students, among the faculty. And I was thinking, man, these these guys are going for the jugular, you know, (laughs) Bias bias for Two. I think the worst thing that ever happened is, you know, a a teacup got thrown in anger, you know, and, and I... I guess a couple of times, you know, somebody spat on another person. Wow. Uh, just fights. No, there was, there was some you, talk about like some food getting stolen at some point or something when I oh, was yeah. checking out your books. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. What's up with you that? Know, okay. So our doctor, our, you know, physician was a expert and really almost an inventor of calorie restricted diets. Mm -hmm. He was a Roy Walford. He was a professor at UCLA medical school. So he was the only one happy. We had cloudy times and we did, we started as reasonable, good farmers. By the end of it, we were really, really good. We weren't, you know, we weren't growing as much food as we expected to. So we were on a calorie restricted diet and for, you know, it was five uh, Americans and three Europeans. This is a shock. When you're hunger, 
you're hungry and there isn't a refrigerator you can raid or a convenience store open 24 seven to go down and buy junk food or whatever. So we were on this calorie restricted diet. So we very early decided for morale, we're going to put some aside so we can have holidays and feasts, you know, birthdays, national holidays and months without it, we invented them. And some people, so, you know, so the great thing was to have a huge spread of unbelievable, you know, beautiful food. It was all organic, beyond organically grown, you know, more than you can eat. And so some people would put, you know, part of their cake or pie in the refrigerator. And then they would come back a day or two later and they'd find somebody hadn't just eaten it all. They had taken a portion of it. Mm. Like scalpel. Yeah. So, so we had to lock up, you know, bananas down in the basement. Mm -hmm. Sure that hungry biospherians, you know, didn't, didn't rate it, et cetera. But that motivated us to grow more food. And I was kind of the leader of the pack on this. Uh, we called them victory gardens because during World War II, Americans, because there's so many farmers, you know, involved in the war effort, they said, grow vegetables. And, you know, so everybody on balconies or, you know, in the little backyards, they grew vegetables. And during those years, about 30 percent of the vegetables of America were grown in little victory gardens. Hmm. Now, here, here's where life becomes inventive and even humans show flashes of intelligence. I was used to because I'd worked in dry areas like New Mexico or seasonally dry areas like Australia, that rainfall is a limiting factor. The limiting factor in Biosphere 2 was sunfall, hmm. the amount of light that would reach our crops, both you know in the wilderness areas and in our farm. So the meditation, it was like a two-year meditation on where is there sunfall that isn't meeting a green leaf? Mm. And where so we, does the glass also cut down a pretty significant yeah. portion of the radiation? Uh, glass uh, cuts some of it. And then there's struck, even though we had space frame, there's structural shading. Mm -hmm. So we actually only got about 50% of the outside sunlight. Wow. It's and ironic. Then... We, it was ironic because we chose Southern Arizona. Yeah. Because there's so much light. There's so few <laughs> rainy days. And but then we had it two was years. A, it was like an El Nino year or something. But there were two. There were two. Both years that, you know, my crew, the first two-year crew was in were El Nino years. And in Southern California and Arizona, that means more storms, more cloud cover. So it's like I totally understand a lot of human civilizations are, you know, they're really, they, they revere the sun. We're kind of like that. <laughs> Sun worshippers in the desert. That's Sun worshippers. Although you can't get a tan, and we couldn't have daytime lizards because uh, no uh, UV was coming through the glass. Huh. So we had to eat vitamin D. Well, it was wow. either that or spend an hour in front of those UV lamps like they use in. But the plants don't and... care? Like the plants don't need the UV? No, they they don't. I mean, huh. the more the more light, the faster you know trees grow in the rainforest, etc. But there are certain animals and daytime lizards. They need that you know that UV to do certain you know biochemical things. So we couldn't. It excluded a certain number of animals. Wow, hmm. and no UV for two years. That's crazy. Yeah. So when humans start to venture off of their planet. And they figured out all these sorts of technical problems like the oxygen systems and the UV radiation, stuff like that. Is it going to be a challenge still hanging out together for years on end trying to reach another star system? Or Well, I, I like to be optimistic. I think it's a yoga that we need to uh, keep doing. And like a yoga, it's a little bit painful. It takes effort. But we need to not give in to despair and hopelessness. But uh, look at human history. Human history is not a pretty picture. Yeah, there, there's been the rise of civilizations. There's been amazing geniuses in all fields, etc. But there is an underlying aggression 
and in-group, out-group phenomena that I think happens in any human groups. So is I there a way to protect my... against that? Well, okay, let me give you my my uh, positive spin on bias for two. Mm-hmm. Because we all knew that bias for two was literally our mode of survival, and we all love bias for two. Unlike many expeditions where subconscious feelings of jealousy or you know, aggression and whatever, manifest and actually sabotaging other people's work or the mission, the, you know, the expedition itself, that never happened in Bias for Two. No? And of course, you know, all of us were very committed. We'd all helped with the creation of Bias for Two. It was our baby. So there, wasn't, think- there wasn't an out group? Uh, was there an outgroup? Some people felt that. Hmm. And there was, you know, and we'd been warned by people, you know, both from expeditions with friends in the Royal Geographic Society that have put on expeditions for hundreds and hundreds of years, and also astronauts and cosmonauts. The stuff that's gone down, you know, between a space crew and mission control and sometimes between the astronauts or cosmonauts confined. We weren't confined as brutally as astronauts and space travelers are. We had a really beautiful system. You could go and get lost in the rainforest and you know you could you had privacy it big time. Mm. They said, beware the us them dyad. Mm. Sounds like a Pink Floyd song. Huh? That sounds like a Pink Floyd song or something. Is it? Should be. Us, uh, us, okay. Us. Any, anyway, so, and, and I, I noticed that both of myself and other crew members, it's like, you know, we're, we're in daily interface with mission control, with the project management, etc. And there was this feeling, and it was articulated and felt like we're here in the bubble we're here, you know, like experiencing what life is like and what our challenges are. And those people have no idea. Mm. So there was like a class divide almost. Well, I don't think it's a class divide. I think it's like, because that happens between mission control and the astronauts and the astronauts, you know, they're lionized heroes, et cetera. And there was one famous occasion when, a group of Russian cosmonauts on one of their space stations cut off radio communication with ground control in Moscow for 24 hours. Uh Out of anger or something? Well, this is the thing is everyone was shitting a brick down in mission control. I bet. These guys ever going to open up communications. So when they did, everyone like, you know, breathe again we're all turning blue here and they never really wanted to ask what happened hmm. but one of one of our dear russian soviet colleagues was oleg Gazenko, and he was not only the head of one of the major space biology institutes in moscow he was a really wise old dude he he had chosen the dog remember the first dog in space Laika. yeah Laika. Laika. Yeah, anyway, Gazenko uh, chose him from a, a candidate, Street Dogs of Moscow. <laughs> so so Gazenko became kind of the father, confessor, psychiatrist, you know, wise elder friend. And he said that some of the stories about how tense it got among space crews, he didn't hear until years and years after the mission. Because cosmonauts and astronauts, they want to go back into space. And they know if any griping or any stuff that NASA or the Russian space agency doesn't want to get out there, that might impede their ability to get out there. So Gazenko, who came a few times to buy us for two during the building and during the mission and after we came out, he was a really keen observer of the crew. And what his thing was, was that we had fully adapted to life in Bias for Two. 
he said, I, I can just tell that by the ease of movement that you have. And I think, you know, so we, we did everything we could to put all these conflicts between ourselves and between us and mission control on the table. Mm -hmm. The worst thing you can do is let it go underground. And we did everything from reading a seminal book on group dynamics to, you know, invoking the Native American tradition of the talking stick. So you know, we'd all get in a group. Mm. You had to shut your mouth if you didn't have the talking stick and let somebody have their say. And it, it didn't dissipate the tension and the conflicts, but at least it, you know, it made everyone really aware of what was going on. So Roy Walford, uh, you know, one of our crew said, I may have hate, hated their guts some of the time, but God damn it, we were a great crew. We no. cooperated, and I think that's going to be true in space because if we start to live somewhere else and have a life support system, everyone is going to fall in love with it and be beyond what we call mindful now. <laughs> Every other sentence has mindful in it. <laughs> These guys are going to be totally dedicated to keeping their life support going. And that's going to supersede, yeah, there's going to be tensions. I mean, people like each other. They don't like each other. You know, they gang up. This, all, of the, all of the stuff that we know all too well by human behavior, that will happen. And I loved it when they asked Sally Silverstone, who was our captain, and, you know, good, stolid girl from London, lower class, working class. And they're asking about this and sex and whatever. He said, whatever you imagine people can do, they are doing in Biosphere 2. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I wanted to ask about that. You Were there couples that went in and stayed together? Were there couples that formed while in Biosphere 2 that fell apart afterwards? What was that dynamic We like? mentioned there was one marriage before. Mm -hmm. But they were, I think there no, were a couple beforehand. No, I, I don't think that. I think the marriages happened afterward. Mm. But the but, marriage, yeah. That, but that, did the relationship proceed? Yeah, um, you know. So there were there were two relationships: Jane and Taper, and Abigail Gay and Mark Vantillo Laser. And that was the situation before they came in. Mission Control said that wasn't a criterion, and we had about fifteen, seventeen biospherian candidates, and, and the management was looking at you know, who's got the requisite skills, because we have to do all kinds of things. We have to be veterinarians. We need to be plant botanists. We need to be marine ecologists. And, you know, and we need to maintain all the technology and more than a thousand sensors. It was a highly technical system. So they, they picked a array of people, but it did include pe two people who are couples, and that persisted through the two years. And that didn't create an us versus them dynamic of the couple versus everybody else? Uh, hard to say. Huh. I wouldn't rule it out. Because <laughs> one, of the, one of the women had had a relationship with one of the guys who is now in a relationship beforehand. Mm. And, you know, Roy Walford, you know, when we were doing our arts pieces, he had this uh, Moroccan woman named Yasmin, and they had a you know a, a nice relationship beforehand. She was on the outside, and I remember one of our arts festivals. He had this really poignant slideshow of all the times that he and Yasmin met at our famous meeting window, you know, with two phones, you know, whether it was summertime and everything was lush, or wintertime and there was snow and ice on the ground. And then his, the show ended with an empty window. Oh. She, she had left the project. Yeah, so. And what I don't was know, your experience? You know, my experience was uh, an unwelcome, but finally appreciated break from uh, sexual relationships. <laughs> Interesting. What did that, I mean, what, 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 what became of it? Did you, like, what was the welcome part of it in the end? Well, the welcome part of it is I realized that I had a lot more energy 
because I wasn't, you know, like putting it into a relationship and, you know, you know, the, well, you know, the contortions, I, I assume like more focus really. for your work or. Yeah. And for writing. Hmm. Interesting. You know, uh, because I didn't have late night activities of that kind. <laughs> On every, and every night, aside from two, and I'm not sure what happened there, I would go to our mission control, not a mission control, our command room or on a laptop, I would do my computer entry of the journal entry. And I was doing all kinds of other writings. Uh, Gay, myself, and Sally wrote Life Under Glass while we were under there. And we actually published a number of scientific papers while we're inside Biosphere 2. How much of your time was taken up with stewardship of Biosphere 2 versus free time? Because there's this, I ask because there's this thread of, I want to say, utopian communities in the United States. You know, you go back to the Ralph Wando Emerson and the transcendentalists, and they have this idea that they're going to move into the country and when they're in the country, they'll have all this time for doing beautiful things, art, music, writing. And then they realize that farming sucks and it's hard. And you're working 16 hour days just getting all that together. Is that... Was and there's that, usually one guy who decides he's going to get with everybody's wife too. Yeah, that doesn't seem an exception. Is everyone's wife too? Well, there's almost always one charismatic person who's like, well, all the women are mine. Yeah, well, like elephant seals. Uh, <laughs> we had we had charismatic men and women, mm. we had pretty dynamic people, but that that didn't play out. And I remember, you know, Kevin Kelly, you know, who helped start Wire, and he was an editor of Coevolution Quarterly, and he he wrote some of the best pieces about Biosphere Two. You know, go check them out. And Coevolution Quarterly he wrote a really long piece. Bio two at one at the one year point, and I remember you know him talking to us. He was a friend. He came to some of our institute conferences, and he said, you know, really my my deep dark fear about you guys is you're going to become eco surfs. Hmm. And I've I've I keep on reading in news accounts that we were working like sixteen hour days, or seventy or eighty hour uh, work weeks. And, and wasn't, do you think this was the way that humans survived for wait, thousands of on, years? Hold on, hold on, hold on. First off, that wasn't true. Oh, we I didn't see. Have the, we didn't have the energy to do that. Hmm. We, were, we were on that calorie-restricted diet. <laughs> and then after six months, you know, oxygen was, you know, was limiting our activity. But, but the reality was Jane and Sally were, um, you know, they were in the agriculture more than any of us, five or six hours a day. The rest of us were really two to four hours. You know, we had a, a Saturday morning clean up the habitat, get out the vacuum cleaners. And <laughs> Sunday, aside from who was cooking, and, you know, I would cut the fodder for the animals on a Friday or Saturday morning. So I'd have Sunday off because psychologically, it's really important to have time, time off. Hmm. So we didn't spend, gazo- you know, gazillions of time. I know NASA and anyone looking at space, they're dreaming of automating and having robots go in and plant the crops and harvest the crops. And I'm not sure that that's going to happen. But you can see, you know, astronaut time in space or on a planetary surface is so incredibly valuable. Not that our, our time wasn't valuable. Do you and there- and there were people who found farming boring. I found it a challenge. Hmm. Really found it. I think we talked about the victory gardens and, you know, the spur of hunger and wanting to eat more and more diverse things was an incredible inspiration. Did you grow all your food or you brought some stuff? Uh, we had grown some crops in Biosphere 2 before closure. Hmm. You know, we had started the agriculture, I can't quite remember, six months, nine months before gotcha. that closure. Because, I mean, my God, you go in there and you don't have any food in the pantry. You sure. Just... But everything you ate was grown inside a biosphere? Almost. almost. Near the end, we decided to, to dip into some stocks of grains and beans that were in there as a, a um, 
a seed stock for future closures. Hmm. So, you know, we were trying like hell and we grew about 85% of our food, you know, so pretty much we did. And, you know, the pleasures and the, the incredible freshness and wholesomeness of this food was quite remarkable. What was your diet like? Uh, heavy on sweet potatoes. Hmm. <laughs> but we grew about three or four different grains from millet and sorghum and wheat, uh, oats. Uh, we had a little kitchen garden, what the French call the potagerie, with all these vegetables, which were a major component of our diet. And then we had we had sweet potatoes, white potatoes, yams, and we had fruits. We had a little orchard, and down in my basement agriculture, we had some um, lemon trees, orange mm. trees, didn't produce that well, fig trees, dates. In the basement? Yeah, it was a it was a basement, but the light came in. I see. So it was part of the agriculture, and that that was my domain. I was in charge of that. It also included the uh, the constructed wetland for cleaning up the sewage. Was there livestock of any kind? Yeah, we decided uh, that we wanted to have as normal a diet as possible. So we had chickens. They were a cross between these tropical. Chickens, uh, <laughs> silky chickens, and banties, mm. uh, and they were pretty hardy. Then we had, and we wanted to have dwarfs, so we had a type of dwarf uh, pig, and we had these African pygmy goats. Wow. So it was quite a little menagerie. In there. And you were using the chickens for eggs, or did you eat the chickens also? Yeah, we 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 uh, milk and meat and eggs. Yeah, came out of them. Well, you got but, milk from a chicken. <laughs> I was talking generically about all three of them. Yeah, that makes more sense. <laughs> so, it's possible. I did a project in Algeria. We had dairy from uh, camels. Whoa. Whoa. Cheese and yogurt. What did yogurt. it taste like? What was that? It was great. Hmm. So you aliens should go to North Africa and see the, the mix of you know, the regional cuisine. And since that was the French colonial area, it's a great, it's a great symbiosis or synergy. We'll put that on the list. So I have, I have more questions, obviously. Mickey, did you have one? Go ahead. So in terms of how much equipment and supplies you needed for Biosphere 2, after you came out, did you have a sense that it would work to go to space like that? Well, you know, the thing about Biosphere 2 is um, we can't build a structure like that in space. Forget glass space frames. Mm. You know, space is a harsh environment. And I remember actually finally calming down some of my, you know, space science uh, friends and colleagues by saying we we're trying to launch the idea of biosphere two, that eventually we have to learn how to do mini biospheres in space. For God's sake, we are not trying to launch, and it'd be ridiculous, you know, to to build anything like biosphere two. But you know, you'd have to have radiation sealing. Mm. You'd have to have incredible anchoring, because on Earth we've got a, a fairly strong atmosphere. And we have strong gravity that holds things in place. So, and we, we need to learn, you know, so by a, a biosphere two type of thing is going to be done incrementally. We're going to need to, it was really exciting news this last week that uh, NASA put some device on that uh, Mars rover shuttle, whatever it is, that could actually extract oxygen from a very tiny amount of CO2 that's in the Mars atmosphere. Hmm. We're going to learn to, you know, live off the land, as they say. You know, we're going to have to figure out how to use space resources to make materials, to make rocket pro propellant, to make soils. Mars looks like it has a reasonable base, but it has some problems. So all that shit and piss of the astronauts on their way there, I know exactly what they're going to do with it, and it's kind of what they did in The Martian, both the book and the movie. Recycle it? Use, yeah, make organic soils. 
And this mm. is what you do on Earth, right? The wastewater gardener, that's kind of about this. Well, and also, you know, I like to say, you know, organic agriculture, you know, big business tries to say, well, this is really weird, you know, this newfangled thing. Everybody in the world who grow, grew food 300 years ago was an organic farmer mm -hmm. because they hadn't even invented chemical fertilizers and pesticides. And there's great examples. And, and we kind of, for Bias for Two's agriculture, we pulled in the Polynesian thing, which is taro and sweet potatoes and rice. You know, there are a number of really great subsystems because, you know, we've been really successful humans at figuring out and, and breeding and choosing and developing which crops and which farming methods work in different places. So with fertilizing using human waste, there is there any problems with using human waste in terms of spreading disease or viruses or anything of the sort? Or is the process of composting basically a cover for that. Yeah, like can people do this at home? Yeah. <laughs> can they do it in the cities? <laughs> I'd love to see that. Only, only if they're intelligent and they're not violating, they're not violating, you know, state, uh, state, local, and whatever county regulations. Yeah, I mean, if composting is done properly, um, there's a, there's a wonderful book self-published that's still a bible in the field called the U Minor. H.U. Manure Handbook, mm -hmm. and it's a really good resource, and, and I read that, but, you know, we were composting here. If you do compost properly, it gets up to a temperature that it kills pathogens, mm. and the other thing is, and I, I always hate people who try to accelerate composting, give it time, because all those pathogens come out, they live in our digestive tract. They can't live out in an aerobic environment. And with time, they die. So I love the, the, the cycle that we did in Biosphere 2 and we had done at all of our ecotechnic projects is do two composts a year. Make some in the spring that you will apply in the fall. Make some in the fall that you apply in the spring. So, yeah, but you need to know what you're doing. And what is, what's the key here? What's the key here? Time and temperature. How do you get the temperatures up? Well, if you make a proper compost heap, you have either leafy green material or fresh manure. And, and mostly, but we, we didn't actually use, well, no, we, we did. Our composting was really from those domestic animals. Hmm. And that was one, another reason for having them because they're great recyclers. So the inedible parts of plants, you know, like the stalks of grains and you know, the, the, the vines of tubers were delicious food for the animals, and they started the recycling process for us. And it then, seems like there's another key, too, which is that soil on Earth, from what I understand, is in pretty poor shape all around the world. Yeah, and I don't know if you guys have talked to anyone about climate change, but one of the really Everybody exciting... seems to chime in on climate change. Sorry, what? You're Almost every... Deep? Almost everybody chimes in to some extent on climate change, it seems like. <laughs> well, okay, but have you heard this? And if you have, I'll cut myself short. If we build one inch of organic soil on all the farms and ranches of planet Earth, we will do an immense job of sucking up the excess CO2 in the, in the atmosphere. And your plants will so grow better. And the plants will grow better and, you you know, farmers won't get broke having to to buy chemical fertilizers and pesticides, et cetera. And the soil will be better for the next year and so forth, too. Seems like a lot of it has to do with the sustainability of the production cycle. You know, and, and the exciting thing for me now at Synergy Ranch is, you know, we only, you know, encountered that word sustainable, but we were on that page. You know, let's make this healthy for the farmers, the orchardists, the ranchers, as well as, you know, for what, what's being produced. But the new buzzword in the new frontier is regenerative agriculture. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. That's what I was looking for. Yeah. And so, so you know, the woman who came to the ranch with a PhD in biology, you know, has been studying this thing and we're beginning to apply it. And it begins with 
start with improving the soil biology, the soil food web, they call it. Mm. Make sure it's balanced. Yeah, and, did you, you know, think the, about microbes when you were going into Biosphere 2? Oh, I'm so happy you asked that question. <laughs> there were some academics in, I think they're in Vienna, maybe Eastern Europe. Anyway, they wrote a paper about microbiospherians, which I kind of loved. <laughs> that term. But we knew uh, that microbes were totally crucial. If you really, you know, if you're really an intelligent human being and you, you know, look at earth history or better yet, you're a biologist or my microbiologist, you realize how dominant microbes are. I mean, we're just discovering, I, I guess, in the last generation that we're either equal microbial cells, human cells, we're a microbial ecosystem itself. I think you're like and 10 to 1. That, huh? You're like 10 to 1. 10 uh, bacterial I, I for each know. human. I think they're still, they're still debating that. That's I, I true. think That's what I wrote true. pushing our limits, they brought it down to 1 to 1. Hmm. And of course, the human cell is really big. But the thing is, we have so many microbes on our skin and our hair inside us to help digestion that we couldn't live, you know, we couldn't live without a biosphere and we couldn't live without those microbes internally. So we enlisted, you know, some really great um, microbiologists, Lynn Mar Margulis. She always said that men biologists emphasize competition and the women are kind of supplying that symbiosis and cooperation hmm. is probably equal or a stronger force in Earth's evolution. Anyway, she directed us to Claire Folsom, and I think we did talk about him. He was the one who first made those closed systems and found out if they were diverse, they would live forever. And so with Claire's help and some of his students, we tried to maximize the amount of microbes and diversity. So I think we may have said this. Uh, in every one of our biomes, we had lots of different habitats and regime soils, watery places to maximize the diversity of microbes. Smart. So even ahead of your time. You huh? That seems ahead of its time. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. Were you looking to see <laughs> were you looking to see how the biomes changed over time? Yeah, you know, I I went and did my PhD with H. T. Odom, and he and his brother, the systems ecologist, they were really big into, you know, one of the main processes that keeps our biosphere evolving, adapting, and surviving is self-organization. So this is the idea that if you make the right conditions, you know, if it's a rainforest, you can't get too hot and you can't get too cold. You know, it needs to be quite moist. If you have a desert, you have different limits and different kind of soils. And then basically the strategy was to put in so many species, including the microbial ones that nobody can inventory, uh, that they would have a chance to self-organize. Mm -hmm. And the really, you know, to me, one of the great successes, you might call it a... And do you mean by self-organized, they're structuring the health of the plants or and the other organisms? Well, they're, they're, they're sorting out. Our ecologists tried to have, we know, food chains, food webs. You know, they're all of these different trophic levels, something, sure. feed something sure. else. Yeah, so we, tr you know, the ecologists, went, they, they called it species packing. Hmm. And nobody in the world could predict, you know, how many species and what types would survive in bias for two conditions. So they tried to have lots of duplicates that could fill every niche because we anticipated, and indeed we had different amounts of, you know, from 30 to 70% species loss. Wow. So we still wound up with functioning ecosystems. Well, you know, we, we put in, what was it? 3,800 species of plants and animals untold numbers of microbes in one hectare yeah but a lot of species showed up that weren't invited from what i understand too there was a there was a few and it was really interesting. it was really like interesting. the roaches was it uh the cockroaches were not <laughs> invited we actually had some cockroaches because they're part of the you know breaking down organic matter we had some little black ones in the rainforest 
But they got but out of the rainforest. Behold, we had the common cockroach appeared. No, no, it's a different species. But, you know, you have to picture this massive construction going on. I mean, in spheres. Sure. Was that one day we'd run into a rattlesnake, <gasps> and we, you know, th- we did put some snakes in there, but no venomous ones. <laughs> but Smart. a few, a few, a few birds volunteered. We couldn't get rid of these sparrows. I mean, mm-hmm. and we were putting up bird netting and trying like crazy. And there was this beautiful bird, a rock wren, who took up residence and mainly in the desert, a little bit in the savanna, and he had the most beautiful song. Okay, so here's celibate Mark. And I, you know, I'd be going around the biosphere, and here'd be this wren up on a, a rock or a tree, like singing, advertising himself to a mate. Aww. And did did he realize that, you know, hardly any air molecules went between <laughs> biosphere two and the outside? He wasn't gonna find a mate. But maybe he was just singing because he was happy and, you know, he had a beautiful song. So that was one of our volunteers. The cockroaches that we, I think we talked about sucking them up and feeding them to the domestic animals. And getting... <laughs> yeah. And, it, and it, you know, it'd be really interesting. Did anybody do this study like to sort of inventory what microbes were there at the beginning and how they changed? I don't know if this was before, this was before PCR and. Yeah, uh, I think that's really, really, really difficult. I think at most what mi- microbiologists can do is check that all the functional families are there. Gotcha. But one of our consultants, a guy named Don Spoon from Georgetown University, he discovered maybe a new species. It was a microbial uh, insect that actually got the name Biospherica because huh. it was first discovered there in the ocean. Hmm. And, you know, I mean, the world of microbes is still really, really so Huge. difficult, unknown. So he didn't know whether that was a new species or just in the environment of Biosphere 2. It thrived in sufficient numbers that, that he could collect it. Were, were there problems with disease and sickness in the biosphere over the time that you were there? Uh, virtually not. That's we We had... Tr- it's it's wild, isn't it? And I, I don't think anyone quite expected that. We had Roy Walford, you know, who is this, you know, uh, professor at UCLA, actually had to get trained and get a license in general practitioner in medicine from the state of Arizona. Hmm. And we sent two people to to the U.S. Navy. How do you how do you pull a tooth, you know, uh, at sea when there's no dentists or yeah. So we were prepared for pretty much everything. It was kind of an interesting story because we had we had shared all of our germs. So, you know, one of the things about making holidays is it was just amazing how often people on the outside in Michigan Control or other consultants were sick. Mm. And we only started to see this, our our scientific advisory committee recommended that we use the airlocks to send samples out to decrease the amount of lab work that we had to do inside and to bring in, you know, specialized scientific equipment to do new studies. And when that happened, you know, uh, we suddenly started having this really, really mild colds or flus. Uh, Like an immune response. Well, no, well, what we finally figured out was that they were being really careless on the outside and they were sending people to put the stuff in or take it out who might have the sniffles, who might be marginally sick. Well, it's really interesting and, because, it's, you know, but so. Yeah, go ahead. Go, no, sorry. I, I was just going to say, it seems like this kind of happens on Earth where the you usually like look at the history of the Americas or the history of colonization, colonial development throughout the world in general, it's almost never that the microbes go back toward the colonizing populations. It's like, yeah. it almost seems to inherently involve a big population, industrial population that brings these microbes to where they're going. To a small, isolated population. So in this case, the outside yeah. world is the reservoir for the virus right. or the infection. And they bring it to you where you experience it well, it's interesting that like the common cold or an inflammatory response could 
be really any sort of immune reaction to just experiencing new epitopes in general. And it seems like if you're in the city, you're just constantly experiencing new people's epitopes. Hmm. Just saying. Anyway, we, we finally figured it out. And when they did a health check and only sent healthy people, we call it the airlock flu because it, it, there were so few microbes there that you didn't get a full blown case. Mm. So what was quite remarkable, there was virtually no illnesses aside from, I think we talked about the feast days. So, you know, people would get Eating in too much yeah, it's for gluttony and stuff. <laughs> and this, this is kind of interesting because meat and milk and eggs were really a tiny part of our diet, really tiny. Uh, that two of the crew started to get such gas pains when they ate meat products that the last three or four months they said, you know, we don't want to do that. So we actually, because we had a good database, we gave them more of other foods that they were nutritionally taken care of. But, you know, in less than two years, if you eat very little meat, you know, at least part of our crew lost the ability to digest it well. They also ate very little in general, too. I wonder how that contributed. <laughs> we ate more. You know, I've heard other humans say that, like, eating meat and other things is a very different experience than just eating meat alone. Also. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not on that page of, uh, what is that, the, the paleo diet? I think it's the carnivores. I'm just saying, some of these carnivore advocates that I've heard, they're saying that when you add other things to the meat diet is when you run into this gas and these problems like that. I look forward to the you day know, that the carnivore diet activists just start eating humans after they've eaten all the animals. <laughs> bugs. <laughs> right. Yeah. Oh, I don't know if bugs yeah, would have the same thing. Put that on the record. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's where we're headed. Um, so, okay. There's, there's one thing that I really want to know about, which is... The oxygen. What happened? Oh, the oxygen. The oxygen. You know, so there we were worshiping the microbes and trying to make plenty of space for them. <laughs> so it turned out, I mean, and what I loved about Biosphere 2 is that before we closed, you know, I, I was on a scientific review committee that I was part of the advisory committee. We would end the meetings by going around and people would say their 10 greatest nightmares of what happened. And, and there was never a shortage of nightmares. Nobody ever said that we would start losing oxygen from the, our atmosphere. And what made it doubly interesting is it took real detective work, scientific detective work to find, find out. What was happening? So, huh? What was causing it? Okay. So what we finally deduced was that because we had made our soils rich so that the trees could grow up in the wilderness areas, that the food crops could be productive, that we had so much organic matter in the soils and they weren't at a stable you know, situation. Our, our, our agricultural soil came from an old pond and it probably was still a bit anaerobic. Mm -hmm. I don't have to get too technical on you. But anyway, so, so what was happening was that the, there was so much microbial activity in the soils and they were taking the oxygen from the air and combining it with, with organic matter and releasing CO2. Hmm. Doesn't that make them aerobic? Yeah, they were aerobic. I see. Sorry, I thought you said anaerobic. No, I that, that was another conversation. Anyway, but the mystery was we were losing so much oxygen. I mean, when we first discovered it, we had a faulty sensor about six months in. It had dropped from over 20%, which is what the Earth has, to about 18%. That's 3% oxygen. In how much time? In six months. Wow. Yeah. So that's a hell of a lot. And the mystery, if, if it had just stayed in our atmosphere as carbon dioxide, there wouldn't have been a mystery. And we probably would have had to leave Biosphere 2. So where was that carbon dioxide going? 
And, you know, this is when Columbia University, uh, Jeff Severinghouse, who was doing a PhD uh, at Lamont Dougherty, got involved. And they're interested because there's a slight decline in oxygen in the Earth's environment. Anyway, it was a lovely story, and we used uh, isotopes to try to track, you know, what the processes were, how CO2 was cycling, and CO2 is cycling really fast. And here, here's your usual science thing, a bolt from the blue. His dad was a construction engineer, and he said, concrete, check the concrete. Hmm. Just, you know, um, Builders, you know, concrete engineers, they know that unsealed concrete absorbs CO2. Mm. Because we had, you know, sometimes 10 times the amount of CO2 concentration compared to Earth's environment, that absorption was happening really faster, more profound. So we took uh, cores of the concrete inside Biosphere 2 that was unsealed. And similar, the same concrete, same pour that was done outside. And we studied how much carbonation, that's the absorption, was happening. So that was where most of the CO2 was going. And it was being mm -hmm. by concrete. And to me, this is a beautiful, I think we talked about the technosphere and the biosphere. Mm. Like, you know, the technosphere, and this is equally true, obviously, in Earth's environment. Our technosphere is part of the biosphere, and unpredicted things happen. Well, yeah, when you make materials that haven't been on Earth before, you're going to get weird interactions between the materials you invent and the biosphere. It's so I'm happening. still trying to understand what mm -hmm. happened here. Do you understand, Quinn? Yeah, so there were microbes that were taking the oxygen out of the air and turning it into carbon dioxide. And they just weren't aware that the carbon dioxide was building up. And so they didn't realize that was the culprit for that. No, 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 no. We, the were oxygen. Tracking, we were tracking CO2 like demons. But it was hiding. Exactly. It was being stored. We, th we think, you know, there was some amount of absorption in soils. There's a lot of desert soils that will absorb uh, carbonates. I get it. Uh, but but probably the major source was the concrete, and Got we it. so that could have endangered that the, the um, what's the word structural strength of biosphere two so over time. The, over time, because as that CO two gets absorbed, it weakens the concrete, and then you're getting closer to the structural rebar and steel. Mm. <laughs> that holds a building up, including Biosphere 2. So during the six months of research and system improvements, we also sealed every bit of concrete we could access. And the really good news is that the second crew did not have a drop in oxygen. And we decided, you know, because we were stalwart maniacs and we wanted to maximize our research, that we would ride the CO, the the oxygen decline down as far as we could, so it went on for 16 months. And how'd you and feel when it started getting below 16 percent, 15 percent? People started some some of the crew developed sleep apnea. Yeah, well. They felt like they were that's right, that's right, suffocating to death. And because we had this analytic laboratory, we we're actually able, you know, for for um, lab purposes to isolate CO2 from the atmosphere. And we, we ran lines to their rooms so they could sleep through the yeah, night. That's right. That's right. So what would you learn for, or what did they learn for the second crew or for going forward? What would NASA take away from this in terms of keeping the oxygen steady and still maintaining a microbiome inside of the biosphere? Well, you know, it's, it's a difficult trade-off because a small, a, a young system, you want everything to be able to grow. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the, the balance is, and it was interesting, Columbia, when they published these papers about, you know, solving the mystery, they said it might take 10 years or 20 years before this stabilized. It actually stabilized in about five years. And the uh, the ratio of carbon and nitrogen, which kind of says how mature the soil is, 
So Biosphere 2 very quickly matured. I see. So it was just a temporary bump. So, but you rode this wave down, you said, for 16 months? Did it start to regenerate on its own? Did you do something? What happened? <laughs> uh, and we're all, we're all getting, you know, a little bit more crotchety and grumpy <laughs> with each other. We're not only, you know, half starving to death, although we, we, had, a, we had a nutritious diet. Uh, and we're really moving slowly. So the two anecdotes... One is that some of our friends who were part of Mission Control and on the staff, it said, you know, we've been watching you guys and watching you guys work like in the agriculture or whatever duties we can see from the class. It's like you're moving slightly in slow motion. Hmm. It's the human organism, you know, if you know your, your body really knows how many calories and, you know, what's the nutrition I'm getting that way, how much oxygen am I getting? So finally, a, a tipping point was when Roy Walford was trying to add up a, a series of numbers and he couldn't do it because, wow. you know, wow. you start to lose your cognitive thing. And we had like 15 consulting doctors at the University of Arizona. So, you know, the, the consulting team said, that's it. You have to inject oxygen because, you know, it could get serious. Yeah. Serious. Well, because you could have serious damage from that over an extended period well, of time it right? seems like yeah. people in denver and nepal adapt to it right well you know we were actually at about 13 and a half thousand feet elevation although you know bias for two obviously didn't move but the oxygen depletion was like we were mountain climbing at the slowest conceivable pace but because the air pressure didn't change Hmm. You know, this is why, you know, like Everest and other mountain climbers, they make a base camp and they spend a few weeks to acclimatize. And the, the you know, the body has a number of mechanisms, including making more red blood cells to, to move that oxygen around. Gotcha. So it was, it was really interesting. And another example where bias for two, because it decouples things that on Earth you, you know, it's very difficult to decouple. So there was a whole spate of research. And then on the human level, when we, when we decided to pump liquid oxygen in that became gaseous, we kept it in one of the lungs so we could precisely measure before we released it. And almost all the crew went down that evening and we stepped through the, the closed door of the lung and we're suddenly in actually in a super rich oxygen environment, 28%, not mm. the 21 that we have at Earth. And immediately people were laughing and running. <laughs> Just how, you know, it was like ecstasy, absolute ecstasy. Wow. And I realized in that moment that I hadn't heard a running foot inside my answer too. We were all like, you know, very parsimoniously marshalling the energy from food and oxygen. And I felt like I had walked into that, uh, I was maybe 45 at the time. I felt like I was 120, 90 anyway. That's incredible. Then, so then I felt like a teenager. Hmm. And then when we left and we walked, you know, up the couple of flights to our rooms in the habitat, with every step, I could feel that I was getting older again. And then you start to realize, and people have been saying that, you know, what's weird about having a conversation with you is that you can't complete a sentence hmm. without stopping hmm. and breathing. So, you know, what do we take? You know, we earthlings, I'm sure you aliens are all on top of a breathable atmosphere. We earthlings take for granted oxygen. Right. I was going to say, what sort of precautions could be embraced because you guys had to obviously link up with the outside world for this but are there chemical solutions to generating oxygen like what could what sort of backup plans could be imagined for well, space flight or things like that i was wondering about the carbon dioxide if it hadn't been absorbed by the concrete could you rebreathe it or could plants have grown to regenerate the oxygen well, plant, you know, plants were growing and it was really interesting because we started a whole research on the oxygen and it was, 
first off, it convinced all the skeptics I knew in NASA about Biosphere 2. When this came out in the newspaper, and we were dropping on average one quarter of 1% oxygen per month. Mm -hmm. They were saying, you bastards, you have sealed Biosphere 2 to an unimaginable degree. Because if it was as porous as the, the closed systems that we build, you would never have seen something that was so subtle and so small over time. So they it thought was, it was leaking, it, basically. Well, if if we had enough leakage exchange with the outside, we would never have even discovered the oxygen. Right, so because it would have just come from the outside world, yeah? Gotcha. Yeah, so, so you know, we were, talk we're talking about to understand, you know, biospheric systems and, you know, get ready for building more challenging and more complex life systems in space. That's why these facilities, even though it's really expensive, a lot of really hard engineering, uh, if you don't really make a closed system, you don't see these subtle things that are so crucial. Mm. Right. So crucial. Tightly controlled experiment. But, so I guess I wonder if you had something like Azola ferns or something that could grow off of the increased CO2, you don't think that they could have regenerated the missing oxygen? You know, uh, when our Russian friends heard about the <laughs> decline in oxygen, that's exactly what they told us to do. And we had a lot of spare parts. So in, you know, this dark part of the basement, the technosphere underneath the biomes, hmm. we actually rigged up, we, we home, you know, DYI, do it yourself. We made an algal tank. Mm. We put lights there. But you know, we're talking about enormous amounts of oxygen. But what what I find really interesting, so it's a it's a great lesson. And nobody who ever does a closed system with soil is ever gonna, you know, not pay super big attention to that trade-off of growth versus, you know, having a stable, mature soil. So we we did try that. What and, an amazing and, experiment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, and I think, you know, I, I often call the biosphere that we all stepped into, Biosphere 2, it was a bonsai biosphere <laughs> because the trees, it, it, the, the trees maybe had gone in a year before closure and they were like four to five, six feet. They'd grown a few feet. But during the two years, they became prodigious. Oh, my God. Some of our early successional rainforest trees, they, we use Lucina. Uh, they grew from like five feet to 35 feet in two years. Wow. Is that normal? But part of, part of how Biosphere, in fact, self-organized was that the imbalance, you know, the, on the simplest terms, it was an imbalance between plant photosynthesis and respiration. Because the microbes are respiring just like uh, any other animal does. Mm -hmm. And as the plant life increase and we did studies and surveys we think that the biomass more than doubled during the two years that we were in there well. so as biosphere was growing up these early imbalances you know were being corrected i remember reading something about the trees and their structural stability oh yeah can you speak to that yeah Oh yeah, that was uh, <laughs> that was another unexpected problem. You know, in the rainforest, we kind of knew. I mean, this rainforest had like eighty foot ceilings. I mean, you know, we, this was seriously a hundred year experiment. Uh, so that means it has and, to have eighty foot roots or something, right? Well, I mean, our soils were really deep. I think in the rainforest they were six, seven feet deep. In the agriculture, they were only you know two or three feet which is plenty for an agricultural system. But we had proposed a ventilation system to move the air. So one of the problems in Biosphere 2, and it was just too expensive. You know, mm. it was an expensive project, but, you know, would have cost $30 million because of the state of solar um, electric technology at the time. We wanted to, you know, we wanted to have renewable energy, but that price tag, probably in today's dollars, it's probably a, a fraction of that. Anyway, that, that system, you know, was nixed. And so we had, you know, really hot ceilings. 
because here we are in southern Arizona in the Sonoran Desert, where it, it you know, the rainy day is really the far exception. So that was one problem. And our rainforest trees, you know, couldn't handle 140, 150 degrees if they got up 50, 60 feet above the soil. The other thing is because of that reduced light, which, which limited our agriculture as well, we only got 50% of ambient light. Mm-hmm. So the plants were ateliolated. And the bandwidth was limited too. Yeah, no, no UV. And no stress, you know, no stress wood. No shear stress. We, well, no, no, no. There, there's a thing in biology that, you know, trees really thrive and they're used to in the earth environment. There's always big storms and big winds and all that stuff. And that pr- makes the tree produce what they call stress wood, mm. which reinforces. And we, you know, we had kind of an air circulation. It was partly how we cooled the thing down, but it only produced really gentle breezes, you know, to cool off systems, mainly mm. heat, heat some in the winter. So the three factors that it was really hot for the space frame that uh, things are growing rapidly because uh, limited light and high CO2. So things were going prodigiously, no stress wood. So we had drooping trees and and we started to, and when I go back to Biosphere 2, they still have a beautiful rainforest there. They actually have a lot of those trees tied to the, to the uh, space frame. Hmm. We started, we started doing that. It was really sad when you'd see like a 25 foot tree start. (laughs) (laughs) Is it Biosphere 2 still there? What's, what's the state of affairs right now? I know we're running out of time. We need to know what's happening. Okay. So Columbia (laughs) university took it over and ran it for about six or seven years, did some very cool stuff, you know, some very important uh, climate change business. Then it kind of fell into a black hole. And then in 2006, 2008, Ed Basks, our investor who retained control, he donated to the University of Arizona. Hmm. Now, Columbia wasn't interested in it as a closed system. No humans after our second crew have ever lived in there. They got rid of the agriculture for a long-term soil development study. And they tried to separate, they did separate a lot of the uh, wilderness biomes, but they're, you know, they're doing research. It's a, you know, it's still open to the public. It's, you know, I, I still think it has tremendous inspirational value. And of course, you know, when I go on tours and I often try not, not to have the tour guide know that I was, a <laughs> I want to, I want to hear what they what lies and, and Poor tour guide. And, but, you know, most of the people I have to say, they're really interested. How did people live in here? And is that where they did this? And, you know, is that where they did that? Be, and, and I think, you know, taking people out has diminished a little bit. But I'm very thankful that it's in good hands and it's still doing lots of both, you know, undergraduate and postgraduate uh, detailed research and is open to the public. What would really it take good. to put another crew in there yeah that was i was gonna ask that why only two crews uh because they were oh did we jump over that Mm -hmm. oh there was there was a power struggle which also polarized the crew there were great divisions on the outside about how this amazing facility that no one thought could be built and operated how it should be run sure yeah didn't some oligarch get involved at some point well, he was involved. He was, he was a fellow director, Ed Bass of the Bass family of Fort Worth. Very visionary guy, you know, has, has contributed and worked. He worked for, for a decade and a half in our ecotechnic projects, kind of, you know, ground truthing it in pretty tough conditions. But anyway, he, Steve he, Bannon uh, too, right? At some point. Yeah, he called in people like Steve Bannon to take over the project. So it's pretty surreal. And, you know, the people who've watched Spaceship Earth, when Steve Bannon appears (laughs) during the takeover, there's like this, this was a crazy story, or, you know, before this, my God, is this really true? (laughs) Yeah. So, so yeah, they took it over and it was pretty painful. And, And I have to say, one of the sad consequences is somewhere in that Columbia period, most of the data 
which had never really been analyzed and published, is missing. Whoa. There's, a hell of a lot, there's a hell of a lot of papers that did come out about Biosphere 2. I yeah. keep on hoping, but you know, the University of Arizona, it was long gone when the University of Arizona took over. What, what, what do you mean like gone? Like Columbia lost it in a fire or something? No one either knows or is telling the story. Well, so why didn't they do more crews? It seems like once you build the, you did the hardest part, which is building the thing. And to have just well, two know, crews. You know, for some academics, uh, we have time to, to do this. Yeah. Some academics, you know, they, they don't understand an experiment that involves humans. Hmm. And, you know, we got this critique. Well, your humans you know, are so messy. And you're too emotionally attached. And, and I true. confess. You might get you your feelings hurt. You might sue somebody. It's just a liability. Oh, there's that liability. I think that's the least of it. You know, their thing was, you know, you're too emotionally attached to it. Yeah, which I think was part of the point of history. <laughs> exactly. But partly, you know, the story that we had to tell the rest of us biospherians who don't know it on the outside is if you actually experience your connection with a living world, mm -hmm. and I hope we have time to talk about that. Yeah, go on. Changes, we got all the time in the world. Oh, okay. That changes, you know, how you think about that world. And if I haven't said this before, you know, one of the things that I really got from Biosphere 2, I think I described, you know, feeling that connection in my body at a cellular level. Mm. Mm. Well, you were how, eating how, the food from it and the animals that were grown there and the air that was made there. And you, you, know, you hear I mean, hunters talk about this all the time. Hmm? Hunters and people who live on farms are always talking about, you know, how you don't really know what food is until you actually grow it or hunt it or have that connection yeah but but it's even more than that it's like every drop of water that humans have has been through that water cycle innumerable times mm -hmm. you know we we're talking about oxygen the fact that we have a breathable ac atmosphere yay plants mm -hmm. yay this radical invention that threatened life on planet earth you know i mean so modern men i think modern people people you know are in a delusion that i think you know didn't afflict humans. They didn't understand that there was a biosphere, but every you know pre-Western culture had a reference. They understood that the earth is sacred, and hunters, you know, we make offerings if we're going to kill a deer. You know, that there is that reciprocal relationship, and we were, you know, during 99.9% .9 of human evolution, we were pretty connected to nature. And we understood, you know, we're not the most powerful agents here. There's lightning, there's lions, there's poisonous much, you know, you know, we, we actually had a humble attitude about it. It's only modern humans and we've created these comfortable houses and cities and villages and mechanized this, that and the other. And we've really, you know, gotten into a fantasy that the environment and the biosphere is something outside of us. That we're think, not connected to it. That's a really good point. That you can't really exist without the plant that's outside your window. So thinking of yourself as separate is a little delusional. I think that's a really good point. But don't you think cities are also, I've at least read other humans advocate that they're sort of the most environmentally efficient way to triage the problem away from bigger nature spaces. How do you actually no, bring I, that recognition into a city? Do you think well, that... You well, know, first off, biomimetic we, we architecture, need... bringing parks. What, what's the solution? Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm total, I am a fan of, of cities. I grew up in New York. I love going to cities. You know, Santa Fe is a little town. It has some <laughs> cultural life. No, there, there's, a, there's magic of concentration of people, and especially in the modern world with so many cultures and museums and concerts and dance. So you know, how do you keep people in touch? Well, that this is the real question, and I, you know, a lot a lot of our solutions are win win win. So this whole th notion, which I don't even think I heard about thirty years ago, except instinctively, green the cities. Yeah. You know, make make the rooftops, you know, vegetable gardens and lawns, and put trees there, and make more, you know, open spaces, and you know, every everything else. I mean, how do you incentivize that? Well, it is being incentivized. One is that it's part of the solution to global climate change. 
yeah. I went to a series of really great United, United Nations meetings, and they were called the Case Cities as Sustainable Ecosystems. Mm. Uh. And I went to one in Perth because I was working a lot in, in Australia. And it was so fascinating, you know, because just like ecologists talk about ecosystems in, quote, nature, cities are, are a part of nature. Sure. Are. Humans are, we are the biosphere. So, so you can analyze, you know, just like there's a circulation system for nutrients. How does the food get into cities? What's the transportation? What's the, you know, what's the living arrangements? And making that more green is not a sacrifice. You know, this thing about, uh, now they call it environmental justice, mm. that, oh my God, look where all the chemical plants and sewage plants are. They're in the poor ghetto parts of the city. That's just outrageous, outrageous. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's kind of a win-win. And I hate environmentalists. I hate the term environmental because it, it, it kind of reinforces that here's humans and our life and there's something else. No, you know, the environment is everywhere and we're part of it. You're never outside of nature. So it's not like we have to give up. No, we are nature. We're as nature as a Bengal tiger and a blue whale and a boab tree or, you know, whatever, whatever charismatic plant and animal you crop to or a microbe you know we're as important in the biosphere as microbes of course we have to regulate ourselves we need to be stewards not of the biosphere but of our own actions but anyway my, you know my point is you don't have to incentivize it you just have to find ways to get people out of fantasy because thinking that you're an island you know that humans are an island that you are not part of your environment your your ecosystem your biosphere that's insanity well a lot of that comes down to the mastery of the corporation doesn't it well there is a whole other topic yeah hello hour 3 biosphere, <laughs> whether the topic whether the biosphere can survive untrammeled you know corporate uh mega capitalism is it's a well the question is why has nature been removed from the food cycle in cities like why is it easier I, i'm sorry maybe i'm making the assumption that it's easier but i assume people don't grow the food on their own roofs because it's easier to just go down to the quickie mart so well i think that the extent I, I think that corporations was... have contributed to that and to the extent that people are just doing what's easy i mean this is a very difficult thing to deconvolve yeah I, I think there were a lot of efforts to um, make the system that we have and make those limits. You know, for example, when I first went to London, I think this is true in a lot of Europe. You know, I took the train in from Heathrow Airport into central London, and I was looking at all of these little backyard plots of, of land, mm. and they're clearly growing vegetables. And this is called the allotment system. And I think, you know, when the urbanization happened in Europe, you know, very pervasively, they understood that these people would want to grow their own food. And so they made these allotments. And, and I don't know whether it's adequate to the current population, but they're now really prized. And I'm wondering, I, I don't remember that that ever happened in the United States. I, I think it's just Happened in the Mark. Soviet Union too, from what I understand. Yeah, the Dutch. Egg. Yeah, yeah, in Soviet Union because their agriculture was so deficient. <laughs> you know, I think they had a little limited privatization, and I think it was something like five percent of the farming area of the Soviet Union produced like forty or fifty percent of their food because it wasn't some big collective with big tractors and you know you grow food and it would be shipped off any you know somewhere else. You grew it in your backyard, a fruit tree or two, and you could pickle your, you know, your your stuff, which the Russians love to do. Yeah, so I mean, we have institutionalized, let ourselves, you know, get more divorced. You know, cities when they become greener are going to be just so much better. Do you have you know, much like, faith in vertical agriculture, like indoor, tall warehouse growth type of stuff? I am not a huge fan. How come? 
Uh, well, it's very it's very capital intensive. I'm mm -hmm. not against capitalism. I'm not against small scale businesses, uh, but I don't think that that's a solution to feeding the world. And I I think by the way, you know, follow the money. Yeah. When you think about why things are the way they are in the modern world, it's not necessarily because it was more efficient or more life enhancing. It was because people who controlled certain technologies and governments, you know, found it profitable to to set up things. Of course, but Which what's is, the solution to that? Yeah, people love easy. A, people love easy. People love getting rich, too. But they love not having to farm. Come on. I mean, people stopped farming not because they didn't, on some level, want to stop farming. I talked to a cattle well, rancher, and he said he'd never gone on vacation his entire life. Ever. He was like, I, went, I took my wife on my, like, our 40th anniversary to a canyon 30 miles away. Never been there before in my entire life. Like, yeah, no, this this is a this is an issue for sure, but but you know on the other hand, you know biophilia, you know we really bond humans, you know just the way we're wired with plants. Yeah, and I I was really interested, in, you know, when Spaceship Earth came out, it was super locked down for COVID, and it was re getting really hard to buy seeds because so many people were, were starting to grow vegetables in their backyard and mm. do their house plants. And my thing was, you know, it's really difficult to visualize the biosphere, you know, fall in love with your house plants and the tree that you can see out your window. Yeah. We just got our first house plant in here. Mm -hmm. Very nice little yeah. guy. <laughs> <laughs> Makes Is me happy. Really a, oh, it's a glorious blog. You guys don't have them. It's a space plant. <laughs> I thought it was. But I was going to humor you. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I so, guess. Yeah. What comes next? Yeah, what comes next? Is there going to be a Biosphere three? three? Can we can we start Biosphere three when we get there? Can I? Take uh, I'm I am still hoping the original idea of Biosphere two. I mean, we named it two. Presumably, because there was going to be a sequel. Well, no, we we named it two because people didn't even know the name biosphere, the term biosphere. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, so we, you know, it was kind of like a straight man line. They'd say, well, where's biosphere one? Is that some project that you did before? No. <laughs> that was my first question. <laughs> biosphere one is the only biosphere currently we know of in the universe and certainly in our solar system. And you're part of it. But the other idea was, yeah, there should be biosphere three. Well, the Japanese you know, made a closed system thing in northern Japan, a little yeah. bit like Biosphere 2. It had domestic animals, people, plants, and I think they had an aquatic, a mini ocean and mm. forest area. But our, our thought was, because it's so important, I mean, our survival really depends on changing how people think about biospheres and how we understand them. That there needs to be biosphere three, four, five. Every big city should have one for public education and research. Every university should. And the fat lady hasn't sung. I like this. We've been looking for a long-term project. There you go. We've <laughs> we would love to let the alien biosphere. Yeah. Yeah, I'd take a turn in it. <laughs> I, I continually have dreams where I'm going back into Biosphere 2 or into some other closed system. Well, maybe there's still time. What is your, what's your biggest concern for humans over the long scale, short scale? Like, you've built Biosphere, you've seen the importance of human relation to nature, the recognition that humans are nature. And when you look out at the species today, what do you see that keeps you up at night? What do I worry about? Yeah. What's your biggest like worry? Everything you guys worry about, climate change, the destruction of wilderness areas, the sixth extinction, and, the, and that the quality of human life is simultaneously being degraded, you know, because we're not greeting cities fast enough. 
Say but more on the about other, that. What do you think? The, what do you mean the quality is degrading? The green cities. Everybody's living in these dystopian techno. Just being cut off from nature. You know, or, yeah. Sorry, I shouldn't say that. Cut off from plants. Yeah. Animals. Well, not only that, but we put up with, when I was doing research for pushing our limits and I started looking at synthetic chemicals and how little testing happens before they are unleashed by tens of thousands in quantities that absolutely are terrifying. That's our favorite axe to grind, actually. And air pollution. Air pollution. You know, I love London, and we have one of our echo checking projects, the October Gallery in the center of London. But I'm coming from New Mexico. We're 20 miles out of Santa Fe, which is a tiny little village, really. And I go to London. I love it for the cultural life and the history and and, you know, the stimulation of the city, but I can barely breathe hmm. central London. And, and they've tried to put a big tax to, you know, limit the amount of traffic. And, and you know, they have these uh, signals that you have to virtually run across the street because they're they're intent on keeping the cars moving. <laughs> you know, And it's really sad. And, you know, so my hope is that people are going to wake up and say, this is not allowable. We're not going to eat food that has all these chemicals in it. We're not going to breathe polluted water. We're not going to let chemicals, you know, that are completely untested, you know, get into our food systems. Well, the and first I, we, step is they have to know about it. It seems yeah. like. True. You know, There's and, a lot of plausible and, deniability on the part of the consumer right now. Yeah, you know, you know, in Biosphere 2, we were so nervous about indoor air pollution and all the rest of it and water pollution. So we had a serious laboratory. Mm. And I was thinking, you know, that I had a friend, uh, Jay Levin, who started the L.A. Weekly. He's still in, L in L.A. You should, you should look him up. Mm -hmm. But when he was running the L.A. Weekly, I think this is in the late 80s, early 90s, and other people did as well. He sent one of his journalists down to the supermarket and got all the stuff with the USDA, FDA stamp of approval, and they sent it out to laboratories. And they, they started revealing all of the pesticides and herbicides and weird shit that's in the food. And I'm thinking exactly, I totally agree that if people actually had this put under their nose, and then it's fairly easy if you're a good engineer and you know what's happening in your city. You know, what industry is putting that shit into the air or into my water? Well, that's why I asked about incentives a little while back. It's because if the information ecology is controlled by the highest bidder, then it's just the price of business to make sure that people only, you know, people only have so much time a day to gather information about what's happening in their world. And if right. the information they're being fed is based on the highest bidder, then... Well, it's gonna... also so complex, it's so complex, right? So if you're getting food that's being brought from Peru, but you're buying it in Boise, Idaho, the polluter right. is deeply separated from your experience of it. Yeah, I know. And if it's called organic, what does that mean? Yeah. If, if it's traveling, I think on average... The American, American meal has like six or seven countries' wow. produce in it. Sounds and on average, on average, food travels hundreds and hundreds of miles, if not more. So the one thing, by the way, about those vertical you know, plant factories yeah. is if that's done locally, that is going to be a step forward. I'm not crazy about hydroponics, but we, you know. The key is locally. Be, yeah, exactly. Like, yeah, totally. And, you know, you know, we we are very proudly certified organic, but really I love going to going and being part of farmers markets and people meeting farmers and, you know, that it's local and you talk to the guy and you can ask him, you know, what sprays do you do? And sometimes you have to, yeah. you know, that is so much better than the, the anonymity, you know, so it's also very satisfying. I mean, I think that the way forward and the next generation is going to be the generation that starts to undo the hold of the corporation. It was, nice, yeah. it was so strong for the last 40 years on Earth since maybe the 1980s. And now everyone is so aware of it 
that the only thing that seems like it's stopping people is that they have the sense that they're powerless. Have you run across this? Yeah, that, that's one reason that I emphasize optimism as a yoga, because mm. we can't we can't afford to be negative and doomsaying and in despair, because then you nullify that you can make a difference. And the first difference, you know, I'm, somebody's got to make a difference. Yeah, and despair <laughs> is the key we thing. All, we all are making a difference. Yeah, you, you, know, and, and, you, and, and, you and, and you and you and you and you and you and <laughs> you. That exactly, and another thing in Biosphere Two was the beauty of there were no small anonymous actions. Mm. Everything had consequences, and you could see it. I love that. And it was so it was so beautiful. That's really difficult in Earth's environment, but it's possible. And you know, and the Buddhists and many other traditions, the first step is to wake up out of your fantasy, out of your sleeping state. So yeah, I mean the it, the problems that we were motivated to start the Institute of Ecotechnics in 1973 to build Biosphere Two, yeah, the problems, you know, the momentum hasn't really changed, but there is a huge awakening. I hate to use that because now that's another question. <laughs> anyway, there's a kind of a change of consciousness and the way people are talking about the human biosphere relationship. I mean, well, I think there's a real zero yeah. step, which is the pain, right? It's like people have to start hurting. Things have to start actually affecting their daily lives, right? Like that's when the change comes. That's when people look at their lives and they're like, this hurts. Well, like, they have to be able to have someone who helps them connect the dots, right? And that's what journalism is supposed to be about. That's what these art projects are supposed to be about. Because it's not enough for it to be happening and for them to feel the pain, right? People have to be able to understand what is actually causing that pain. If you don't think that 3M or DuPont is responsible for the pain, how could you ever control that? If you never realize, if you never put two and two together that Teflon gives you cancer, how can you right. fix it? You know, air pollution is, the, I think, the third or fourth biggest cause of human death and shortening of life. It's just astonishing. Um, yeah, I was going to say something, but I suppose I think what's you guys will figure it out. Yeah, what's reassuring is that it seems like massive environmental destruction is salvageable. Have you ever been to Mount St. Helens? No. Mount St. Helens erupted. Is that? Hmm? Yeah. Well, yeah, right. so it erupted 40 years ago. And one of my favorite stories about the place is that the scientists, after the eruption, basically were like, nothing will grow here for centuries. This will be a desolate wasteland. But that spring after the eruption, a lot of the gophers had survived and they started coming back up through the ash and they brought lupine seeds with them. Mm. And so the pumice plain, this place that was just the surface of the moon, blossomed, it bloomed because of all the seeds that had survived. And now it's one of the most biodiverse and healthy ecosystems in North America because it's been preserved from development. You can't even hike in there. All the more reason that individuals can make little actions and have it actually pan out. And it's like destruction can feel so paralyzing. People have this narrative of the death of the earth, but the biosphere will recover as long as pressure is taken off of it. Yeah. I mean, I also take comfort in that, the you, you know, we humans, we have survived for what, 100,000 years, depends on how, we are survivors as well. Yeah. You can't, you know, you can't count out common sense and intelligence breaking out. And I, I know what I was thinking about the pain. Mm. I mean, it's shocking to me every time I, I read about how many, what percentage of Americans are on heavy pharmaceuticals. Yeah. It seems like 50% of the population are taking antidepressants. And then there are all these other pharmaceuticals that, that kill 
like a hundred thousand Americans a year, by the way. Yeah. Not people drugs, prescription drugs. So there's this vast emptiness, you know. So back to my theme, it's it's really a win-win, you know, to embrace your reality that you are, you know, my God, you won the lottery. I'm I was born on planet Earth, and maybe you know I wanted to live in interesting times. These are really bloody interesting times because all the extrapolations look devastatingly awful. But extrapolations don't play out, and they're not inevitable. I love that. I really do. I think that's a good place to stop for today. But we should catch up again. By the way, are you based in LA now, guys? We're like by the Crab Nebula. Yeah, somewhere out there. Oh. I know. Okay. <laughs> but we're using Pacific but, but Standard there, Time for but, but there content. but there is a wormhole between the Crab Nebula and LA. We're making Where friends. Well, I get to LA and I get to New York when travel becomes possible. It'd be fun to meet you guys. Yeah, mm-hmm. let's hang have out in person. At, let's have a beer at a pub. Hell yeah. Yeah. Americans call it a a, a bar. I'll okay. drink some earth beer. Sounds like a plan. Okay, it's really been fun. Thank you, Dr. Nelson. You guys, you guys have loosened me up. <laughs> what are you What are you working on these days? Yeah. Where can people find uh, you? Well, I mean, practically, I'm, we have an orchard. We've expanded our organic farm here. Synergy Ranch, right? Synergy Ranch. But, you know, I, I also am looking at the ecotechnic projects, and I spend time in Puerto Rico on our forestry one that, that's really doing exciting stuff. Wow. And I, yeah. Very and cool. we're trying to develop some digital and participatory education programs using the ecotechnic projects. Hmm. And also we, we've got partners, kind of like-minded people in Argentina, Brazil, and in Catalonia. Very cool. So, yeah, it'd be very cool to to share that with the with the universe, both digitally we'll and hands on. Yeah, put it out there. We'll put it in the show notes too, in the description below this episode. Yeah, we'll link all your books. Great. Thank you, Dr. Nelson. Thank you so much. You guys are doctors too, aren't you? Or did you drop out? Technically. Space doctors. It's been a while. <laughs> <laughs> I only make uh, people that I don't like call me Dr. Nelson. That's fair. Does that qualify us? No, no, you guys are you're friendly aliens. It's like the last feudal title on Earth, so we try <laughs> to enjoy it when we can. I guess we can call... Well, you look like a spaniel... <laughs> You look like a Cocker Spaniel. I'll take that is as a compliment. Is that the inspiration? I'm not sure what your friend is. Yeah, what do you see? A what? I said, what do you see? Well, it could be a gorilla. Mm. have that forehead thing going on. <laughs> you could be a type of monkey or prosimian. I like that. Really, was the Cocker Spaniel the... Uh, you should have seen him before he grew a beard. He was he was inspired by nightmares, not by dogs. Watched some videos before I grew the beard. <laughs> stuff of nightmares. Uh, the stuff of nightmares. Yeah. I'm actually smiling behind all this hair. You just can't tell anymore. You know, uh, let, I love you know good quotes, so I'll lay one on you if you don't know it. It's from uh, James Joyce. I think it's from Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man. Mm. So now you're finished with science, you should really, you know, do the world literature. Mm. Anyway, there's a great line in there. This priest is trying to convince the young Stefan Daedalus to become a priest like himself. And at some point, uh, uh, the priest says something about history. And Stephen says, history is a nightmare from which I am trying to awake. Mm. If only. The great line. Good luck with that. (laughs) <laughs> Indeed. yeah well let's leave it there yeah thank you so much okay Mike. guys bye take care bye take care yeah see you one day somewhere <laughs> we'll find you okay yeah new mexico is great 